Hello. Maybe I don't always share his views, even if he is my boss at the paper where I write and have a column. My next guest is incredibly young for what he does, multi-talented and multinational. Born in Chicago, he made Aliyah at the young age of 14 years old. After deciding that law was not going to be working out for him, he became a journalist. He has been a soldier, by now I guess he's a reservist, and has become a big player in the political journalistic world here in Israel. He's also the author of two bestsellers. He is the editor-in-chief of the massive newspaper, Jerusalem Post. He's married to Chaya, and he's the father of four, I'm sure, amazing children. Ladies and gentlemen, Yaakov Katz. Hi. Nice to have you. <laughs> Honored to have you. Thank you for having me. So, days of thunders. For a journalist, for a politician, you know, when I was preparing these questions a few days ago, I wasn't sure if we have a new government, if we have a new war, if we have a new president. I wasn't really, like, knowing where to direct my questions. What do you think? I think that's the beauty of Israel, right? I, I always tell people that one of the things I love about what I do is that I get to wake up in the morning and I really don't know what's going to happen that day. Right. And on the one hand, that's a great thing about Israel. Right, is, is just how dynamic this country is, how things change, how vibrant we are as a country. On the other hand, I will say that it is to our detriment. Right? And, and, and one example that I can give you is, it was only a month and a half ago that 45 people were tragically killed at Meron, right, on Lagba Omer. And they've been forgotten almost. Right. It's as if people don't talk about them. In another country, if there is anything, if there is a normal country out there, and I don't know, but in a normal country, let's say, this would still be in the headlines. This would be the most important story, a massive tragedy. Heads would be rolling. People would be fired. People would be questioned. But here, nothing. And that's because we move so quickly. Then comes Gaza. Then comes a new government. Everything is so fast and so rapid that we don't have the opportunity to focus sometimes on those important stories that we need to spend time on. We need to dwell on them. Right. So it's a, it's a, it's a kind of catch-22 situation. So true. Italy, where I come from, is still in Corona. Corona by us, it's already past tense. No one here remembers Corona. <laughs> right, it's Who's forgotten. Bibi, he's gone now. For now. For now. <laughs> you know what you're talking about. I What's don't know, but... You know, a lot of people tell me, you know, the Jerusalem Post is left-leaning, is right-leaning. Here you are. Tell us. You know, Hadassah, it's, it's an interesting question that I think often about because we have been critical of Netanyahu over the last few years. I've been editor of the newspaper now for just over five years, and I would say that probably over the last two and a half to three years, our criticism of him has sharpened, has increased and intensified. And intensified mostly around the fact that we began to see, and I think a lot of people in Israel, even those who love him, and, and, and by the way, I think he's achieved amazing things for Israel. Yeah. He really is one of Israel's great leaders. Right. But I think that even those people who adore him, if they take a moment to really think about what we've seen over the last three years, we've seen a politician who has, done, who has put himself first, who has made himself and his political survival the top priority on his agenda. Um, you saw it in the way we kept on going from election to election. You see it in the way he fights viciously and undermines the democratic institutions that basically create the delicate fabric of Israel's democracy, whether it's the judiciary, the police, the, the media, and the justice system. So all of that together is what led to this intensification of, of my criticism and of the newspaper's criticism in our editorial, and in our editorials. But what's important to keep in mind, you know, I always get people say you're left wing or, you know, you're not enough right wing. And I say to them, but why is the where you stand on Netanyahu the definition of being right. right wing or being left wing? And I think, by the way, this is his greatest achievement. His greatest achievement is that he has been able to create a synonym between him and what it means to be right wing. So if you criticize Netanyahu, you're left wing. And you saw that throughout the, all the political campaigns. Bennett right now is created a left-wing government. Bennett's right. probably more right-wing ideologically than Netanyahu, right? But he's left-wing. Lieberman might be more right-wing than Netanyahu. But he's left-wing because they, but again, they're against Netanyahu. Have they changed their ideology? And I think that that's something that we have to, we have to break up that connection. Just because you can criticize him doesn't mean that you've become a left-wing traitor of the state of Israel. And by the way, someone who's left-wing is not a traitor of the state of Israel. Right. It's, it's okay to be left-wing. It's okay to have different opinions. It's okay to argue about politics. 
it's legitimate. Okay. Um, you know that I don't always argue with you, <laughs> but um, I love your views and I love to hear different. Uh, America, what's going on in America? What happened with Trump? Do you think it's a mirror reflection of what goes on here? Are we? I wonder repeating? sometimes who's playing off of who. Though, That's my question. Right? Are we copying Trump? That's Are we copying exactly Trump's America, question. or was Trump co copying what's happening in Israel? I, I think that both sides kind of draw from one another. That, that, that's how I would look at it. There's some things that happened in the United States that we said that our political leaders, leadership said, oh, that's interesting, let's try to take that over to here. But if you look at, for example, Netanyahu's attacks on the media, which is just close to my heart because I'm part of that mm -hmm. media establishment, right. that those have been going on for years, way before Trump came onto the scene. Netanyahu has for years felt like he was the target of attacks from the media and he would fight back, right? The, the establishment of Israel Hayom as a newspaper was meant to try to balance, counterbalance that, right. uh, that media bias that he felt. So I'm not sure exactly who, who, who drew from who, but, but there, were definitely, there was definitely this, this partnership that was created during Trump's term as president between Prime Minister Netanyahu and okay. President Donald Trump. Right. And by the way, that served Israel well, right? Okay. We could criticize Trump, but we also have to keep in mind is that that relationship did bring Israel some strategic benefits. And I don't think that any Israeli prime minister would have necessarily not wanted to work with an American president to get those benefits. They would have, right. maybe they would have toned down the admiration side of it all, right. right? Maybe a little less, but right. but they still would have tried to work with him. And I think that's the role of a Israeli prime minister, work with whoever is in the White House. My criticism would be different, Hadassah. Right. My criticism would be, why did you have to fight with Obama the way you fought with Obama before Trump? And, and there, I think there was also a political agenda that Netanyahu had, which was, I always need to present to the Israeli public an adversary. Once it's Hamas, once it's like Iran, once it's a U.S. president who's hostile to Israel, and th that's always something he needs to show why point. I'm needed, why Netanyahu is needed, and you see that throughout his career. I never thought of looking at him like this, but it's interesting. You know that you were talking about the attack from the media. Did you know that Bibi Netanyahu's wife, Sarah, which she has been viciously attacked, I'm not going to discuss it now here, she is a psychologist of my daughter's school, in Betrana, which is a religious school. And I didn't even know. I went to school one day for a meeting and she's sitting there in the corner. The only thing I noticed is there were two guards outside the door, you know, dressed very modestly. She had no makeup. I wouldn't even recognize her. She, she, you know. And I thought to myself, and after we were speaking, she told me, you know, you don't know what my children have been through for the past, you know, 30 years. I'm not just, I'm not, you know, there's two sides. I'm, I'm at your side because I'm also part of it, but you know, to hear it suddenly from that point of view, I just yes. wanted to share it with you. No, no, I, I, by the way, I hear that, and I'll, I'll just say two quick things yeah. on that. The first is when it comes to Sarah Netanyahu, I, we rarely write about her. I don't, it's not of interest to me. And at the end of the day, the person who was the prime minister was Benjamin Netanyahu, right? right? So whatever his wife might have done, might have not done, the influence that she might have had on him or not, at the end of the day, the buck stops here with. Benjamin Netanyahu was the prime minister, right. right? He's the one who's responsible. The criticism should be directed, I think, primarily at him and not at his wife, right? And if he can't control what happens in his surroundings, whether it's his family or advisors, whatever it might be, that's his problem, right? right. And that's who we should be critical of. Let's leave Bibi. He's, he left for, for, a, now. for now, as you say. You're very young and you're the editor-in-chief of a big paper. Where do you see yourself like in 10 years? Where are you going? First of all, my kids don't think I'm very young. Right? So I guess very young is a subjective, no, uh, is, is a subjective term. I, I, you know, I, I've been now editor for five years. Uh, I've been working in journalism for more or less the last 20 years. Uh, it's been an amazing journey. Uh, I, I very much enjoy telling stories. I enjoy, I'm passionate about Israel. I'm passionate about the security of the state of Israel and my, what I, what I most love writing about our matters of security and military. I was a military reporter for about 10 years for the Jerusalem Post. So I, I'm drawn to that and I'm drawn to being able to tell those stories and to discover new, new stories that take place, new people. And, and, and just everywhere you look, you can find something interesting and new and a perspective that you might not have seen in a different place or in a different way. 
and I always feel like I tell my reporters who work for me now that whenever I would go to a meeting with somebody, like, you know, someone would say, come meet me, I might have a story for you. And it happens to reporters that they call me up and they say, yeah, I went to meet this guy, but there was no story. Mm -hmm. I would say to them, that's impossible. It just, it's not, I, if I went to a meeting as a, when I was back right. a, a reporter, every meeting I would walk away with at least one story, if not more. There's no such thing as walking away without a story. Because nice. it's there, you just have to find it, right? right? And, and that's sometimes a little difficult. Yeah. Not every story is going to be given to you on a silver platter. Right. You got to work for it. But, uh, but there's always going to be a story, and, th and that's what I... But you have I, a passion for it. You're curious. You need that I, sparkle. I, I, you know, I, I, a few years, I taught journalism for a few years, and I, I would always tell my students that there's a number of characteristics that you require to be a journalist. And I work in print, so I could talk more about print, but you have to be able to write. That's a skill that you can learn. I learned how to write. I did not know how to write news when I first entered the, the business. The second skill that you require is you have to have a sense of curiosity. You have to want to ask questions. If you're not curious, you're not going to get information. You have to have people skills, right? So people will want to talk to you. They'll want to share sometimes their most intimate secrets with you, right? And if you don't have people skills, they're not going to want to do that. But you also- But they have to trust you. They have to be able to trust you. Right. But you also have to have something else which comes with time, which is the ability, especially in today's news and media landscape, it's not to tell yesterday's story, but it's to look at what happened yesterday and think about what's going to be tomorrow's Tomorrow. story. Love it. So it's like, it's like the wind test. Like, you know, when you, you stick your finger up in the wind and you see which direction yeah. the wind's blowing, it's to understand where is this story going. So not to report on yesterday's news, but to report on tomorrow's news. And it's not prophecy, but it's about knowing your material so it. well, having that sixth sense almost, yes. that you're Love able it. to predict where, what's going to happen. Where's this going? And ask the questions that will create that story. Love it. I want to end with a point that I was thinking, actually, we were discussing this right before. Um, Sunday was the swearing in of the new prime minister, 12 year end of the BB era. And it was also the anniversary of the death of uh, the, the Rebbe. The Rebbe. Is there some kind of, what do, you, what do you say? What's your take on that? It just came to me now. It's such a special day to have two big leaders sharing a very, Battle dates. Mm. Well, well, well. The trend. I would look at it more. You know, the Rebbe. That was his twenty seventh yard site, right? Right. Uh, for, mm. BB is still with us, and he's still alive. Yes. But but you have. But you do have this. It's tr it's a day of transition. Exactly. For for Chabad and Lubavitch. Although I'm not an, I'm not a member of the tribe in that sense, but it, it that that was a day of transition for the movement, and this yeah. this was a day of transition for exactly. Israeli politics. Uh, Lubavitch and Chabad, I think, you know, I'm not part of it, but, but to me, they're, they're some of the most amazing people and what they do to spread Judaism around the world, no matter where you go. And what, by the way, what, what, what Israel can learn from Chabad, in my oh. view, is that, we're, and I've been, I've traveled, yeah. and I've been places. When a Jew walks in, or per, a person walks in, I don't even know if they're Jewish yet, whether it's on a college campus or it's in some Chabad house somewhere in the middle of nowhere, they're not asking, you know, where do you grow up? How do you convert? How do you get married? What, what shul did you go to? What education do you have? They accept you, right? Israel, we've, we've politicized religion so much in this so place true. to a way that we've turned people away from Yiddishkeit, from Judaism. And, and, and by the way, on that point, I think that there's a unique opportunity right now for Naftali Bennett, for uh, his, his government, to try to bridge between secular Israel and, and Jewish Israel, and Judaism Israel. He, he's a Dati Lumi, he wears a kippah. Right. And, and, and that is what, you know, he could show them what it means to be an observant Jew and, and to bridge that, not, not to make people observant, that's not what I'm looking right. to do, but to create, to, we are the Jewish state of Israel. We're here for a reason, we're here for a purpose. We have a story that dates back thousands and thousands of years. We're not just here because we like this piece of land. Right. We're here because we have this connection, a spiritual connection, a national connection. We need to tell those stories. Right. You know, and we don't. We, we fail nice. to sometimes. And that, that's, right. a, that's an unfortunate miss and loss for our children yeah. right? and, and, and for us as a nation. So I hope that we can do that. Maybe because of the schut of having the new government formed on the yurt site of the Rebbe, Maybe that's what, what this all means. The Rebbe loved every Jew, left or right. <laughs> but a beautiful message, really. Thank you so much. Thank you, Hadassah. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed it.